morning, good afternoon, powerful agents, real success nation. Hope you guys are doing fantastic as always. Hope you're alive, excited, most of all full of energy and really pushing hard to that finish line, right? To like run across the finish line for 2015, celebrate briefly so that we can actually push forward into 2016. And uh, you know guys, today, I've got, I've really been looking forward to this for a very, very long time. The, the guest that I have is a long, long time friend. I mean, 20 plus years that we've known each other. I'm going to introduce him here in a second. And it, I, honestly, I've watched this, this, this man grow from young man getting his feet underneath him to just rock star in the luxury market. Now I see him on TV. I mean, literally... I have these moments where I go, I, I knew him when. I knew this guy when. And so in a second, I'm going to introduce you to my good buddy, my good friend. But before we do that, I, I just want to hit a couple of things for you guys. Um, you know, having been in the business for 18 years, 19 years or so, and really watched this evolution, and, and uh, Christoph, my guest, will, will, will attest to this as well, too. The way that we do real estate right now is so different now than it was 18, 19, 20 years ago, even four or five years ago. And, you know, the, uh, the days of like in the 90s of hard closing and angular selling and, you know, really utilizing tips like or, or, or I want to call them tips. They call them tricks to get people to say yes is gone. We have a much more savvy, much more elegant population of buyers and sellers. They're more educated. And, you know, it's, it's really caused us, I think, as an industry to be able to evolve. And when I look at the evolution, I really think about Gary V, uh, our good friend Gary Vanerchuk. You know, big shout out to Gary V. Um, and his last book, you know, Jab, 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 Right Hook, where he, it isn't so much where you're going in for the kill, you're setting things up, you're setting the relationship up elegantly, you're setting your brand up elegantly online so that when people do their search, they automatically go, there's someone I want to work with. So today, it's all about that online brand, about who you are, about um, when people search you out, what do they find? Is it, and is it compelling enough? Is what you're presenting out there in the space and in the noise of the online world, is it compelling enough to cut through the noise and to get people to say, there's something about that man, there's something about that woman that makes me want to work with them, or at least makes me want to reach out to them? And honest to goodness, my guest today has done that better than I would say just about anybody else in the nation that I've seen. And he's done it in a way, even though he's in a very, very high end market, he's done it in a way that's very cost effective, which is just so brilliant. And, and, and for me inspiring, because you know, if you're a new agent, you can take something from this interview, implement it right away and be able to look at it and go, wow, I'm, I'm positioning myself the same way that Christoph is. So I want to introduce you to my good friend, 20 year buddy, uh, has seen me grow from boy to man. I've watched him grow from like, it just doesn't age. He's like the ageless wonder, man. So uh, I want to introduce you guys all, uh, Real Success Nation, to my good friend, Christoph Chu. Hey, Bill, how are you? I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. My friend. It's hard to believe we've known each other almost 20 years. 20 years, man. I know that was, we were laughing about that here. We were actually having a, having a, a, a laugh before the interview. Christoph and I were in Baltimore and we were walking down like some seedy alley trying to get back to the, our hotel and the convention. Late at night, I think it was. Dude, it was like 1.30 at night. I look over and Christoph is as blinged out as you can get with diamonds and beautiful. Like, and I look and I go, We've got to protect him because at that time I go, Christoph's wearing more than my net worth is right now. So uh, what an amazing uh, path you've had, my friend. And I just want to introduce him to you. I think you got, uh, what, about 25, 26 years of, of, uh, of in real estate right now. Yeah, hard to believe. Yeah, hard to believe. Um, you sell in, is it mainly Beverly Hills? Do you sell like all of, of, of LA? What's your, what's your marketplace, man? I mean, right now, I mean, my office is in downtown Beverly Hills and I try to keep to about a five, seven mile radius, right from out like a circle, but we do kind of go out further and I do co-list a lot of properties and areas like Malibu and Las Feliz and it's a little further out. I try to keep my drive time to the property within 20 minutes. Uh, with traffic. So, but yeah, it's basically Beverly Hills, but we have a lot of all the luxury communities are right around Beverly Hills. So it's uh, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, Hollywood Hills, uh, West LA primarily is the main marketplace. And, and your goal is about three and a half million dollars worth of income this year, which yeah. watch, dude. Yes. I mean, Thanks. that's, 
That's a lot crazy. different than like 300,000 back 20 years ago. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, man. I'm like, wow. I remember you sitting up front at, uh, at one of the seminars and just taking notes. And, and, and you know, to, to that point, Christoph, it's, it's really exciting because you look at no matter where an agent is right now that's listening to this, they make a commitment. And in yep. 5, 10, 15 years, not even that long because there's people like yourself who are so gracious and grateful to be able to share some of the tools and strategies to be able to get there faster. They could be there in four, five, six years. Right? Sure. I remember so well that when I first signed up for coaching, which is probably 23, 22 years ago, uh, I was at the conference and they talked about coaching. It was a relatively new thing at that time and it was a thousand dollars a month in those days. And I thought, God, a thousand dollars a month. I mean, I was worried if I had enough credit on my credit card to make it go through. <laughs> but I also instinctively knew. I thought, okay, I did the ROI, right? I'm like, okay, thousand dollars a month. That's twelve thousand dollars a year. I knew that from what I would learn in coaching, I would make at least ten times return on that investment. So I, I actually, I didn't reluctantly. I, get, I was only reluctant because I was to be embarrassed if the credit card didn't go through. But I did it. I signed up for coaching, and I think that year I made an extra. 150, maybe 200,000. I think I almost, I think I doubled my business that year. So, uh, but I remember, I think we've all been in that place where can I afford it? I think you can't afford not to, at least for me. And I've been in coaching for that whole time. And you're still in the front row every single event, man. I, you're, you're the <laughs> one of the smiling faces that I know Tom and myself look at, you know, like just as our, as our center. So, well, um, I do start row in particular because I'm not distracted. If I'm in the second or third row, you see everything going on. I just want to focus on what I'm there for. I mean, heck, that's the whole point. point. You know, it's, uh, we were talking about online brand. Yeah. And I go to your Facebook page and, and I'm just, I'm, I'm constantly amazed just to see the elegance with which you use Facebook because there's a lot of people that, for lack of a better word, bastardize it. You know, they, they, they beat it up, they use it ineffectively. Um, Things end up on there that you that shouldn't be on there, or they're just it's so grossly over real estate that it yeah. turns yeah. you off. So, yeah. um, why do you think that online brand right now is so important and even more important than it was five years ago? That's a really good question. I think the simple answer to that is, you know, as you alluded to earlier, in today's world, we're so bombarded constantly with so much media and content, and just our lives have become so complicated. I mean. Like we said, 20 years ago, when I, or 25 years ago when I first started, we barely, we had fax machines, we had the old MLS books that were this thick. We had, uh, there was really, computers were just starting in the industry, so, but nowadays everything is on the phone and computers and iPads and it just, it's completely bombarding you. So for me, online is where people are and, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk always talks about go to where the eyes are. And so if that's where the eyes are, and it's always switching from Facebook to now Instagram to Snapchat, wherever those eyes are, you need to be on that platform. And I remember what started me in the social media world six, seven years ago was at Tom's conference in the desert. Gary was speaking, and he said, you need to be Mr. Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And I thought that totally resounded with me. And then he says, you need to be a DJ for content in your community. And I thought that resounded. And he says, you need to start doing video. So all those things really hit a buzz button for me. And I went out, got my video camera. I signed up actually those two couple evenings online because I had no Facebook. I had no, nothing online. I just, I felt I want to be private. I don't want to share my stuff publicly. Um, so I did all that stuff. But it, it, social media today is an opportunity to keep yourself in front of your friends, prospects, sphere of influence, past clients, in a way that is not bombarding them because they choose to see it or choose not to see it. But it's also truly a way to relate to friends much better than you ever could have before. In the old days, I mean, every you know year or six, every six months, you'd call your past client or your friends and say, hey, what's going on? Now on social media, I just check it in the morning, check it midday, check it, and I kind of scroll through, see what my friends are doing, and you can, give them a phone call and jump into their lives and say, oh my God, I'm so excited about your marathon you're doing next week and, and really connect with them on a truly caring and personal level. So it's, it's just a great opportunity uh, to really connect with people in a very special way and to keep in touch with them, see what they're doing, and see what you're doing. And, and it's, I think it's a really fun, interesting, and great way to keep in touch with people. And you know, for me, my whole social media strategy is you capture them for about a half a second. That's all people's time span is when they're looking on social media. So all I want them to remember is my name, Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, luxury and real estate. That's all they need to remember. So most of my posts are related to the luxury lifestyle, real estate, Beverly Hills, LA, and, 
and those things. And that's all they need to remember, so that if and when they're thinking of a referral or a friend moving to LA or selling their house, they're going to think of me first. And at a conference last week, uh, one of the top agents in New York said it so well. She says, the person that's going to get the referral is the last agent I talk to. And I thought that made so much sense because we all know so many agents and not being online and social media, you lose opportunities. I, I know I listed a house for five and a half million about six months ago. I put it on Instagram. The minute I signed the listing, saying coming to market next week. And within five minutes, a, a, a Facebook friend and real estate friend that I hadn't talked to in about a year that actually lived next door called me and said, oh my gosh, why didn't you think about me for the listing? And the re true reality is he's on Facebook, but he never posts. I never see his post, so I didn't link or remember, I know so many agents, that he worked that marketplace, and frankly, I would have probably referred him the listing versus the other agents, because I know him, and, but it didn't connect, and then it was too late. So that's why, that, that was reinforcing what I know, which is to do, keep doing what I'm doing, because it, it's like anything. You never know when that business is going to come through, but you've got to keep doing it, moving it forward, and seeing when it will happen. And it's top of mind. I think that the what I what I keep hearing you say. There's two things right. I just took from what you said. A, you got to be top of mind, right? Yep. And if and if you're not putting anything on there that that supports your brand, because clearly I just got what your brand is. Yep. Christoph Chu, Beverly Hills, luxury, real estate, right? I mean that that pretty much surmises who you are from, or at least at, from a thirty thousand foot level, who your brand yep. what your brand is, and, and, and also I, the inter, the international segment as well, because. Most of my buyers and sellers the last five, six years are international. So now when I travel, I really promote that element of the business as well. And you know, I think being a well-rounded person and showing who you are, because uh, I've always said at conferences that rich people want to work with people that are like them. Mm. So if they see that you're going to the same kind of places they are, doing the same kind of things, have a similar kind of interests, going to the same parties, they're going to think, oh, when I want to sell my $10 million house, or fifteen million or five million dollar house. Hmm. If he knows the same people we know, he's probably going to have the buyer for our listing. So it's just yeah, keeping your name in front of them. That's so important. And that that could work even if you know we we have someone that's from Iowa right now that's listening. You know where yep. they just they recognize okay, here's the the section of the demographic of the population I want to go right. after. So I need to make sure that my online presence really sort of encaps encapsulates yes. that portion, right? So right. whether it's high end or whether it's someone that's, I, co I coach this young couple that's down in Atlanta, very, in very good shape. Um, you know, big shout out to Keely and Jamie Simpson. Um, and they're, they're workout individuals, you know what I mean? And so a lot of their community, their, their, their act activities and stuff they're putting on there have to deal with that. So it sort of pulls it in as well too. So very, very interesting. So how I much is the of who you are and what you want? And like in my affirmations every day, I say like moths to a flame, I'm a ball of light, love, and energy where the people that I want to work with are simply attracted to me and come to me. And I truly believe, we, we've talked about this many times, the law of attraction. Yeah. And by doing certain things a certain way, being truly yourself and true to your heart, you will attract those people. I mean, I, I, just, I share who I am really raw and, and real. Most of my videos are just online, one shot, raw and real. Take it or leave it. If you want to work with me, great. And like Tom says, people want to know you, like you, and trust you before they'll do business with you. Yeah. So, so three you get across who you are. Three major components for sure. You know, it's I think I, I want to hop into something off topic and then come back to this whole conversation on on what you're doing on Instagram and Facebook and sort of like more granular strategies. But you said something here that that really I think is important, and that is know who you are and be able then to push that out into yeah. in, you know into the space into the Absolutely. into the online world. You've had quite and, and you haven't really shared this with too many people, but if you're willing to share it today, it'd be awesome. You, you've had quite a transformation. You know, you talk about like a moth to a flame. Dude, I've watched you go from like, you know, caterpillar to, you know, chrysalis to coming out of the cocoon to just now. Exactly. It's amazing, man. So would you share with us? Because a lot of people look at the end result of Christoph Chu, which is, I jokingly, I think on a call said, it's like, you have the name Christoph, like Madonna has Madonna and Cher has Cher. And we were joking around about that. But honestly, yeah. they look at the end result and they don't realize the path that yeah. got you there. Would you be willing to share that with, with, with us? Absolutely. Well, I think from when I was first born or when I first can remember being a kid, I always wanted to be 
I guess rich. I guess rich was the word. When I was a kid, I'd watch shows like Green Acres and the Beverly Hillbillies, and that's all I knew. And I was like, God, I want to live in a mansion like that someday. God, I want to live in a Fifth Avenue apartment, and I want to have a beautiful wife with diamonds and beautiful jewelry. So I always saw that as a kid. My, my mom was a hairdresser. My stepdad worked at a rare book dealer here in Los Angeles. My mom never made more than $40,000 a year. My stepdad, I think, never made more than $60,000. So we had a regular home. We did travel quite a bit, but it was you know frugal travel, going in economy, you know the cheap way to Europe and that kind of stuff. But uh, I just I was born a certain way, and I remember I was given a book about castles when I was about eight years old, one of mom's customers, and I just loved that book because I thought someday I want to live in a castle. So I always was born like that, and had the dream. My parents didn't have the money, and I always wanted that lifestyle. So I got a book when I was very young. Um, the Power of Prosperous Thinking by Catherine Ponder. And I started, I think I was about 12 years old. I started reading this book, and it was all about creating, writing down what you want and creating the vision of what you want and going towards it. So, so at you know, 12 years old, you know, I wanted money, I wanted to do things, and I couldn't. So I started off cleaning apartments. My mom's customers at the hair salon needed apartments cleaned. And I, on Saturdays, I would have to clean our house with my sister. My mom didn't have a housekeeper, and we'd get $20. And so I thought, well, I can do this for pay. So I would work at my mom's customer's apartments, making 60 bucks in four hours cleaning apartments. Wow. When I was 16, I valet parked cars at, at uh, the valet parking service. And I remember I, I used to do it in Beverly Hills. And I remember one night working at this party, and I think I parked five or six brand new Rolls Royces. And one of them was all white, all white leather with mink seat covers. <laughs> like, Damn. Oh, mink seat covers. And I remember it was like, five or six of the top comedians of the time, uh, Bob, Bob Hope was there, and um, anyways, it was like, I was like so awestruck, and I thought, I could have this someday, and then I worked as a cashier at Dupar's restaurant, I worked at the Hollywood Bowl taking tickets, I worked a lot of jobs, and people think I was just born for money, I wasn't, I just had a dream, I figured out a way to do it, um, it took a long time, I mean, my first year I sold nothing, I mean, I literally made no money, and my manager said to me, Christoph, you've got 90 days to do something or you're out of the office. And I was like so embarrassed and what am I going to do? And I started, I went to a conference and I started prospecting expired listings, started getting business. And then my second year, and my first deal was this, I made $1,700, it was a $33,000 co-op. And then I went from like 30000 my second year to sixty to 100 I was like doubling every year, especially when I started coaching. That really went crazy. But I started from nothing. I just... I'm always willing to work hard. I always love to learn. That's always been something I just love to do is learn, grow, build myself. Can I, you know, uh, Anthony Robbins, constant, never ending. Improvement. So, uh, yeah, I just, I work hard. I look at what's the best way to get there, and I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty and do what I need to do. So, so what do you think are the three things that had you persevere? Because, I mean, for every Kristoff, there's, 40 to 50 or 60 people that had that like I, I want to be rich I want to live in a castle that are flipping burgers no offense to anyone flipping burgers right. I mean if you're gonna flip burgers be the best burger flipper that you're gonna be but yeah. that that had the goal and the vision but didn't fulfill upon it so what do you think the three components for the fulfillment of your your vision from when you were younger have been that's a really good question I don't think anyone's ever asked me that but just thinking about a lot I think number one exposure I was I had the, the desire internally so the next question was exposure. And I was very lucky that even though my parents were not wealthy, from six years old on, every single summer, I would spend three months either in France or in Asia. So luckily, as a kid, I was, you know, I, by the time I was 18, I'd been to France 13 or 14 times, and I visited castles, and I visited Versailles, and I saw the beautiful architecture, and the Champs-Élysées, and the beautiful stores and clothes. So, you know, Tom always talks about exposing yourself. So exposure was really a key to keeping that dream alive, creating vision. When I was young, I created vision boards. When I was 12 years old, I wrote down goals and what I want. I didn't know about goals. No one ever taught me that in school, which I think is a huge mistake, but I would write down goals. I remember I was like 13 writing down my perfect wife. Um, so I think exposure fueled my passion of what I wanted to be. So that's number one. Number two, having knowing what I wanted, having the visual of those things. Okay, how am I going to get there? So I just figured, okay, working for three hours today, cleaning apartments, I can make 60 bucks. Great. Then I can go to the fancy restaurant for lunch with my girlfriend or dinner. Um, so uh, I think that's one. Number two is constantly being educated, uh, going to classes, seminars, programs, reading books, 
cassette tapes. When I first started my career, I was living in South Pasadena and we got married and my office was in LA. So my commute time was averaging about two to three hours a day. Um, I would typically leave before 6 a.m. to beat the morning traffic, but it would still take 45 minutes. Uh, and then I would either leave my office at three to go pick up my wife at home, come back to Beverly Hills for a party. But I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna be in the car two or three hours a day. And this, I didn't know how, long. it was about six, seven years. And I thought, what a waste of time to listen to KPCR or the music. So I just, I had all of my, it was cassette tapes originally, then it was CDs, but all I did, my, my car was my college education. Beautiful. So all I did was listen to tapes and CDs every minute in the car, every day. So I had literally two to three hours of solid script training, sales skills, all that stuff. I mean, over and over and over and over again for years. So, so conferences, uh, exposure, uh, studying and learning, and then putting myself out of my comfort zone. I remember when I moved to Beverly Hills 13, 14 years ago, I was one of the number one agents in my office in Hancock Park, which is about a five miles east of Beverly Hills. And at that time, the top end of the market was about three million. And, um, and my manager used to always say to me, because I was always wearing flashy suits and the diamonds and all that stuff, and Hancock Park was a very kind of established, preppy, old money kind of neighborhood. So I never truly fit in. So it was expensive homes are like a little clump, and then all around it was like lesser expensive homes. My average price was about 230000 at that time. But I was doing 60 deals a year, lots of volume, you know, 20, 30 listings at a time. And I thought, this is, it wasn't exciting me and it wasn't interesting. So when I had the opportunity to come to Beverly Hills, my, it was immediate yes, I just decided to move. It wasn't even a question. And I thought, I need to no longer be the big fish in the little sea. I need to be the small fish in the big sea. And mm -hmm. that was a great new challenge for me. And I knew I would lose business moving and lose clients, but it just, I knew this is where I had to be. And it was the best decision I could ever make because uh, now living, being right here, I'm able to uh, get those opportunities. And they all say, you're so lucky, Christoph. You're, you're an overnight success. And I said, well, 33,000 overnights, number one. <laughs> and luck is, <laughs> luck is simply being prepared when that opportunity came to me. So when the opportunity came to Woodbury Beverly Hills, I was mentally there. I, was, I just wasn't physically there. So I just did it and moved, and I just wanted to be the little fish in the big sea and start over again, like a, another chrysalis. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you probably, maybe you remember this, maybe you don't. Um, I came up, I remember it was a long, it was a long drive to actually get up to Mr. Chow's to have dinner with you and your wife. And, and we were late because we hit that LA traffic. And I remember, I mean, you might, this must've been like 18, 17, 18 years ago. Yeah, a long here. time ago, yeah. Yeah, but even at that time, you were putting yourself in situations. You talked to one of my, my clients, Chris Erdman, uh, I, I think you remember just uh, at the inner circle and yeah, he asked you a question. Yeah, yeah, thank you for taking the time for that. And that's one of the things I, I really appreciate about you is that you're so generous with your time. And I think you find that with a lot of the people, uh, you know, they're at the level that you are with, with Tom as well too. But you said to Chris, you said, I, you told it about a trip. There was a trip where it was like, <laughs> like, could you, could you just tell that story? Cause I think that encapsulates yeah. You putting yourself outside your comfort zone. Now. Absolutely. So we were, he was asking me specifically, how do you get into the luxury market? And all I know is I can share my own experiences. And I just said, I truly believe when I look at my past 26 years of business and particularly the $5 million plus deals, I would say 95% of those deals all came from doing what I love. So this is, uh, it was our honeymoon trip. It was back in 1993. And I think that year I had earned about $250,000. It was like my, third or fourth year in the business. Um, and I remember, I always loved luxury, and I always remember in my mind thinking, I only want the best. So it was our honeymoon trip. We had planned to go to Europe for three weeks, and then we had planned to go to Asia. So we decided to try this cruise line. It was Crystal Cruises, and it was very expensive. And I like to fly in first class, and we, uh, I'd been to Europe before, so I wanted to see the Hotel de Paris in Monte Carlo, which is the most expensive, extravagant hotel in Monte Carlo. And at the... Um, uh, the Grand Hotel, uh, uh, oh, the, 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 um, uh, forget, the, the Greedy Palace in, in Venice, Italy. I call it the Greedy Palace because it's like the most expensive hotel in the world. So that trip, I remember, it cost us $46,000 back in 93, which was, I think it was a quarter of my gross income for that year. Gross, not net. But I knew that's what we had to do. And I said, remember saying to my wife, I said, to me, it's worth this entire year of working 360 days or whatever it was 
to have three weeks of living the life that to me that was the real world and my real life. Mm-hmm. So we booked a trip, went on this trip, did this amazing cruise, and it was from Monte Carlo to Venice, two weeks in the Mediterranean. It was just phenomenal. And I just went shopping like crazy, spent whatever money I wanted, didn't worry about it, just wanted to have fun and be part of, in my element, and do what I love to do. I met a couple from that cruise ship from Beverly Hills. Out of a thousand people, we met a couple from Beverly Hills, happened to be sitting next to us by the pool, became friends with them. Uh, a year or so later, they referred me a client, and I was telling Chris that from that one cruise, I think I've made now $2.2 million over the last 23 years from that cruise. I mean, I have one set of clients right now, we're working on another deal for $8 million and another one for $23 million. With that one client alone, we've done $60 million in closed deals in the last five years. That's all one of the uh, feelers that came from that cruise. And uh, so that's what I was talking to Chris about. And then I love, as you know, I love jewelry. I love fashion and clothing. So um, I love to buy great jewelry for my wife. And because of buying jewelry, going to the parties from the jewelers, meeting the other clients that buy the jewelry, and going, you know, like for like, you know, people are buying Cartier. They see me around town. Then we do business together. So, yeah, so I just have found that when I do what I love, the best things come from that. So that is, that's like you and I have talked about this, it's social farming is the word yeah. that I use for it, right? Absolutely. Where you have your, your social group and then you're, you're, you're farming with your time. You're actually doing the sweat equity just in a different component. So exactly. let's, let's go granular here because great stuff. Great, I mean, amazing, like exposure, having the plan, I get outside your comfort zone. I want to go granular on two components. Okay. Number one would be what are the key components to so being a social farmer? How would I get into that? What would be the, the first steps uh, to be able to do that? Okay. As I said to Chris, to look at it, first of all, what do you love to do? Now, like you said to you about your clients that are in the gym and they're total health people, and that's, that's not my thing. So I'm not going to attract clients in that realm because that's not me. Uh, so I think if you look at first of all, and I'll say people, like the first question I'll say to them is, what is it you like to do? Some says, I love wine. I said, great, you love wine. Then you need to figure out all of the big wine auctions. You need to go to the Christie's, the Sotheby's wine auction previews or, or the wine auctions themselves and meet the other people that love wine. You need to figure out what, what are your passions and figure out what activities and events are in your area that are related to those things and where other wealthy consumers or other, it doesn't have to be wealthy. Let's just say you're in a marketplace, it's 500,000 and it's a, a family town, it's all about families and local things. Just figure out what that is for you and then figure out how you can do what you love in that realm and immerse yourself in those things. I mean, we get a lot of invitations to a lot of events and if it just, if it doesn't resound with us, we just don't go. We have to only do things and events and activities that are in alignment with our principles, our taste, our style, and what we love to do. Otherwise, it's just totally incongruent and it's just not going to work. So I think just look at what you love to do and how that can relate to your business and how other people that do what you love to do could potentially be clients and figure out a game plan and a strategy to get in that world. So as an example, um, years ago I was asked to be on the board of a homeless shelter called Covenant House. And it immediately resounded with me because I was a mentor for I Have a Dream and I loved helping young kids build their dreams and create their goals and get a better life. So I went to the, to the Covenant House, and the whole point of it was to join the board and help these kids. And um, magically, out of doing something I love, which is helping kids create a better life, getting off the streets, I've done a lot of business from that relationship on that board and helping those kids out. So, uh, and it just has nothing to do with making money or spending money. It just had to do with a passion I had immersing myself in that, doing the best I could to help it. I remember when I was gala chairman uh, of the event the second or third year where I had to raise half a million dollars in one night to do that. By doing that from a loving place and kindness and raising the money, I did a lot of deals from that one dinner. Just I didn't do the dinner to make the money. I did the dinner because of the passion and then the rest of it comes. So I think if you do what you love and you do it from a good place and a good heart, again, people will be attracted to that and want to do business with you. So just figure out what you love, how it relates to your world, and how you can do things that you love to do and have fun and somehow attract the clients you want. And, and give, give authentically. What yeah, what very much, very, very important. Um, love, love the universe. You give, what you give comes back to you 10 times. Totally. So I had a question for you. I'm, I'm, I'm making $200,000 a year. 
hypothetically, okay. like I'm an agent making $200,000 a year. There's a, you know, the average person inside this, this uh, organization is, is earning a million dollars. I'm nervous. I'm you know, like being around those types of individuals because it's not my, it's not my normal peer group. How do okay. you, work, how do I work through that? How did you work through that, that sort of concern or limiting belief of, oh gosh, you know, how am I going to handle being in this room? I've never had that concern. I mean, I can be around billionaires and feel extremely comfortable. And actually, I feel more comfortable around a billionaire or someone of that nature than maybe, well, actually, that's not true. I feel comfortable around everyone. So that has not been a particular concern for me. I think if that's something you have a concern about, I think you got to just let it go and just realize that it's not going to help you or forward you in any way, shape, or form. And by having those thoughts, they're negative thoughts, and that's the drunk monkey. We all remember the drunk monkey. Totally. Having those thoughts is going to like put filters and strains of truly who you are and block that wonderful energy from coming out. So you have to just let it go and just realize most rich people came from nothing. And so uh, they're, and they're just people like you. We, they could be a billionaire today. They could be, have nothing tomorrow. So it, the money and the bank or the jewels and the houses is just simply superficial stuff. We're all just human beings at night. We all take showers. We all eat. We're all just the same. So just don't even put in your mind that, oh, they're here and we're there. We're all the same. Um, but one of my coaches years ago said to me, your income will be a direct result of the five people you must spend your time with. So you have to think about that. Do you want your fears and concerns and worries, which is false evidence appearing real, to run your life and not do that? Or do you want to immerse yourself and be uncomfortable and put yourself in situations that will help you grow? And I love to grow. So I remember my first $30 million thing, at the time, my highest sale was like five and a half million. And for about five years, I would go on Caravan every Tuesday, and I would look at every single new listing over $5 million. And one of my friends in the office, they have been a broker for 40 years, she'd come with me, old school lady, and she said to me, why do you waste your time in all these expensive houses? You don't have the buyers for this. And I immediately came back and said, I may not today, but if I do tomorrow, I know what to show them. So I remember a friend of mine called, and we met him through buying jewelry. Uh, I would buy jewelry, we would go to the jewelers' parties, we became friendly with this couple, they liked us, we liked them, they started inviting us to their parties over five, six years, and out of the blue, and this was a time um, in my career, Tom was my coach at the time, actually, and I'd gone six months without a deal. <clears throat> wow. Six solid months without a closing. Oh. Really difficult. And I remember my coaching calls every week telling Tom, and my wife said, why am I getting the office every day at 7 o'clock? Why am I role-playing? Why am I doing my affirmations? Why am I prospecting? Nothing. I might as well stay home for six months. And my wife's like, no, keep doing it. It's the energy of the universe. Tom's like, no, you got to keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. And I remember thinking to myself, this is being really honest, I felt like I was in this like downward spiral, like vacuum, like sucking me down and down, darker and gloomier. And I'm not a depressed kind of person, but I was feeling like mild depression almost. And, but I kept doing what I had to do every day, kept doing affirmations, my meditations. And on a Sunday morning, I was at the office at 8.30, which I always was, I get a phone call from our friend saying, Christoph, we want you to come over tomorrow. We, we're moving out of the country, we want to sell the house. And I'm like, wow. And I was like, so excited, but then the nervousness came in. I'm like, oh shit, oh, oh shoot. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I, like, I knew it was like a 30-ish million dollar house. He's a big CEO, and I thought, Oh my gosh. So I said to my wife, I said, honey, I said, look, I've got to do what I got to do this morning, but I'm going to come back to the office at noon, but I need to prepare for my presentation. I spent eight hours that afternoon, that Sunday from 12 to eight, putting together my formal presentation. I'd never done a $30 million presentation. So I went to the listing appointment the next morning, eight o'clock, sat down with him and I had everything ready. And I went through, do you absolutely have to sell your home with the smiles and the, uh, the old way, right? Up, you know, the, you know, affirmations. Nodding says, your, oh, nodding yeah, your head. Exactly. You remember how many years we went to sales classes together, you and I? Absolutely. So many. Yes. And uh, he says, "Yes, we do, because we're moving. We're leaving the country. Uh, it, we're moving out of the country." I said, "Great." I said, "Are you willing to price your home to sell?" Right. And he says, "What price are you thinking?" I said, "It should be listed for twenty-six and a half million. It should sell for twenty-two to twenty-three million. He says, "Well, we want to list it for thirty million. And I said to him, "Would you like me to handle the sale for you?" He says, yes, I would. I mean, literally, that was my presentation. And, and then, he, then the next thing he says to me, he says, well, how much is your commission? And I had worked this through in my mind all day on Sunday. And I did all the, I actually did the calculations. And I had the guts enough for $30 million to ask. I said, 6%. Smiled, downswing, 
And he was, and he looked at me and he says, I'm only paying you $1 million to sell this house. But I knew that was like 5.35% commission or whatever. So I said, done. And I wrote in $1 million in the commission. Did How did that feel? Okay, come on. Let's, I mean, a million dollars. You haven't had a commission in six months. And you're writing in a million dollars in that. That's right. $1 million. So I think when I left in the car, I think I screamed. And I went, like this, you know, because I've never had a $30 million listing. And when I saw the $1 million, I was like, holy Camille. Um, so, yeah. So, but, uh, and he never looked at the presentation. He never, but I had spent four or five years getting mentally ready. I spent eight hours preparing. And so, no matter what objection he threw my way, if he did, I would knew I was ready to handle it. And luckily, the objections were minor, and I handled it, and I signed it. And I sold it, and it, and it actually sold for $22.5 million. A little bit over a year later, I took a year contract. And the funniest thing about that house, it was truly still to this day one of the most beautiful homes in that area of L.A. called Homeby Hills. And at that time, it was the highest sales price in the history of Homeby Hills. But the fun, funnest part about that particular law of attraction, I remember the first day we went to that house for a party six years before, my wife and I pulled in the gates and said, oh, my God, they live here? We were like blown away. The architecture, the location, I mean, it was just one of the most beautiful homes I'd ever seen. Well, uh, July of that year, uh, when they were leaving, they, got, they called me and said, you know what, we're leaving, moving out of the country in two weeks. Would you mind living at the house while it's for sale? And I said, well, I don't think I can do that. We've got our two dogs, our three cats, and our whole house, and my mortgage. I said, I don't think we can do that. But let me think about it. Called my wife. She said, are you kidding? Yes, we're going to live there. <laughs> So I called him up, we made a deal, and we moved in. We lived there for like eight months in this beautiful mansion in Homeby Hills through lots of great events and parties to promote my brand, my business, the sale of the property, and we sold it. And uh, I didn't double-end it, unfortunately, so I didn't get the whole million, but I got half of it. Yep. And uh, so it was just one of those magical, magical things that um, pre preparation, hard work, uh, dreaming, visualizing, and it happened. So, and dude, your skills, that's the key thing that I look at right here as I, I, I look at, you're using, we always get that question of, well, what's the script to use for a $10 million property? It's the same, almost same type. Same type. Same, 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 same. We're teaching the, the I forget, what's it called now, the, the class you do with the sales script? Ed. We're doing, so we were doing a sales ed. Like a I did that when you guys first started that 20 years ago, I remember that first year with you and um, uh, Matt, uh, Matt and Tom and yeah. yeah we went, I think I went to six different sales edge classes during that 12 month period. We were at all these junky hotels like in San Diego and <laughs> Sacramento. I remember, I'm like, what are we doing? These mo Some of them were motels. Yes. And we'd be there for three days jumping and chanting. And re 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 but I did six of them in that year. I remember it. But those sales skills, it's like now those are so ingrained in my mind. And to me, most of the time, I, I just use that, for the five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute listening presentation. Oh, you absolutely, you know, and it works. It's that present. It's the presence that you have. It's the confidence that you have to be. I mean, you. Do you want me to handle the self, or are you nodding your head? And so, okay, we're we're running. You and I could sit here and BS for two hours. I, I want to go right. back. I want to circle back around to one thing before we leave because I, I had promised this. From a social media standpoint, what are three things that you do on a daily or weekly basis to keep your brand top of mind for, for uh, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, whatever, to keep your brand top of mind for your consumers that are out there and, you, and your database? Like you said, when uh, most people maybe have the wrong strategy, where they, when I first started in social media, I had the wrong strategy. I was doing 80% was just real estate, real estate, real estate, which I think was boring as hell. So now I've, I've evolved and I have business pages where it's all business and I have personal pages which is all personal, not all personal, but I would say it's 65 to 75% personal um, and then uh, 20 to 30% business. So every day, usually in the morning, I post something related to real estate or LA. It could be a beautiful sunrise, it could be the palm trees, it could be some a beautiful shot of a listing. Uh, so usually it's one or two real estate posts a day. Um, with one of my listings, maybe one or two posts a day, something related to the industry articles about the marketplace, where buyers are coming from, how to, you know, something to do with that. But the rest of it is kind of the beauty of the luxury life of Beverly Hills. I'm selling the Beverly Hills LA lifestyle. Totally. So I share that lifestyle. Whether it's the wonderful restaurants, the great parties, the beautiful stores, uh, the streets, 
um, I share it. And uh, I love to video blog. It's just it's a very easy way for me to blog. And it's much, in the old days when I had my website, I just have to write articles and put the photos. It would take hours. With the video, I turn on the camera, one take, a minute later it's done, put it online, and it's done. So I, I share, like Gary said, be the DJ for content about your community. I just share what I see is the beauty of the lifestyle of LA and what I do. And take it or leave it. Again, I want to attract people who love me, trust me, respect me, or like me, will do what I say, follow my advice, are rich and fun, and I can be friends with. That's my client. So I whatever I do, it's through that filter, and I will hopefully attract those that want that from me. And those that don't like that world aren't going to be attracted to me, won't do business with me. And if someone, I mean, I remember if someone calls you from a video to do business, they like you already. And I remember four years, three, I think it was four years after doing many, many videos, and I would tell Tom, I said, Tom, I keep doing all these videos and I haven't monetized it yet. And I think a few months later, I get one of those random phone calls, a lady who called me. We had a 45-minute conversation first time. I found her house for $10 million that she bought. She sold her house for $5 million, referred me a $5 million buyer, and a two million, all within the span of six months. All from, all from doing what I love with the videos. Yeah. And you know, she said to me, I said, what? yeah. Uh, you know, you were what saying I, something? I was just going to say, what I, what I really – there's two things here, Christoph, that I think are so critical that I don't want to get have them glossed over. Okay. Number one, know yourself, which you have hit so succinctly. Number two, know who you want to attract. Know Absolutely. that client that you want to have, right? Yeah. And and then just you know everything that you're doing is designed to pull those two together, right? I yeah. mean that's that's really what's taking place here, man. Dude, there is there is so much information inside this interview. Like I'm. I've got, I got two and a half pages of notes right now. Holy cow! Wow. Yeah, I'm sitting here going, "Oh, I love that! I love that! I love that!" So, if you had to leave these guys with one last thing, um, you know, what would it be? Like they're listening to you. Here you are, three and a half million dollars worth of income. It's just the beginning. Incredible lifestyle. What would you leave them? What's your one thing that you leave these guys with? I don't think so. I'd say be positive. Focus on who you are and the beauty and wonder of who you are and what you can bring to this planet, to your customers, to your friends. Share that beauty of your world, whatever that world is. You could be uh, on a farm in Iowa and have the beauty of the horses and the chickens and the nature. I mean, share the beauty of the world as you see it because that will attract others to that want that world that you're part of. Be yourself, be loving and kind, share with others, Try to do whatever you can to block out the negativity. When those negative thoughts come in, those downtimes, just say thank you for that thought. I will put you over here for now and let me do what I love and who I want it to be. And don't put your energy and time on negativity or bad things. It just stuff happens all the time to all of us. Just how quickly can you let it go and move on and be who you want to be and create, like Tom says, your world by design. That's the bottom line. Beautiful, man. If, I, if they want to get a hold of you, how do they do it? Facebook is the uh, best way or what? Facebook messaging or email Christoph at ChristophChu.com. Uh, Facebook messages, I get so many, they kind of get lost sometimes. So emails are probably an uh, easier way to, they won't get lost in the shuffle. So yeah, um, and you know, I'm at every Tom Ferry conference pretty much. <laughs> and it's Christoph, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E at, yep, at Christoph, C-H-O-O-Chu.com. Yep. Okay. Chris, ChristophChu.com. Dude, this ended up being as good, even a lot better than what I expected. And, oh, and really, you. you know, you and I are so busy. We don't get the chance to connect enough. Yeah. I just want to tell you, dude, over the years, I've been inspired by you. I love you to death. You're one of my favorite people that I get to see at the event. And keep growing. I know uh, everyone here with Real Success Nation is going to be like standing ovation for the information and the genuineness uh, and the authenticity and the great strategies as well too, man. So I appreciate you. Thank you for your time, man. And cool. for, for all of all the Real Success Nation, if you, you know, have questions, please reach out to us at TomFerry.com. That's T-O-M-F-E-R-Y.com. If we can do anything to support you, if you have any questions, hey, it's the end of the year. Keep pushing hard. As Christoph said, get rid of the crap in the head. Get rid of, you know, like keep, you know, putting yourself in positions that are uncomfortable. Have your plan. And most importantly, keep moving forward. Hey, Christoph, big shout out to you, man. If there's ever anything we can do, let us know. Otherwise, we appreciate you and are grateful for you, brother. Thanks you so much. And I wish you all great success. 
Just take one point and just do it and just be yourself, love life, and share the love of your own personal life. Thanks, See you Bill. soon, Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Christoph. Take care, Bye. brother. Bye.